All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to our students online as well. Welcome. All right, let's just begin with a word of prayer. Then we'll get into our teaching. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful day, Lord. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for, Lord, all that you've done for us, all that you're doing, Lord. And even as we come together to learn your word, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will minister to our hearts, uh, that we, whatever we learn, oh God, will impact, empower us, Lord. And uh, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord. We pray that uh, uh, that our hearts and minds would be tuned towards you, uh, towards, towards what you are teaching us this morning, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So last class, we've been talking about the teacher that we looked at. Uh, the teacher in the early church, and we looked at a lot of aspects, and we stopped at, uh, okay, let's do a review, right? We did about the teaching believer. We talked about how each one of us as believers are called to teach. Then the ministry of the gift of teaching, uh, very importantly, do and then teach so so that, you know, whatever we do, uh, people watch it and we, we become an example. Uh, do not teach the commandments of men, meaning don't get into uh, false kind of teachings. Teach what is true, what is the truth of God's word. Uh, then Jesus says in Matthew 28, go and teach and preach across all nations. And very importantly, we saw the Holy Spirit is our main teacher. He's the one who uh, guides us. He teaches us uh, in every aspect of our life. Right? That's where we stopped. Well, we also looked at teach with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, so uh, this is one thing that all of us, it doesn't matter where we are standing in life, uh, how much we know in the scriptures, but every time we study, we learn, we can ask the Holy Spirit to give us the wisdom to understand what we are teaching, right? Now, what is wisdom? like? So if you look at the scriptures, right, there's so much that we can read and it can just go past us, right? Until we, you know, God gives us a certain kind of wisdom and we realize, oh man, this is the weight of this word. This is what, you know, Jesus is talking about. Or when you look at the Old Testament, you know, who, who knew? I remember the first time I was reading about the Old Testament. I had no idea all of those sacrifices pointed to Jesus and how it pointed to Jesus. Right? So the more we study, we read God's word, the wisdom of God enables us to understand. Right? And we can always go to the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, I, I don't understand this. Can you give me the wisdom? Help me to understand. Right? And that's why we always say, right? We're reading God's word, we read it again and again and again. Every time the Holy Spirit can minister to us. Right? Every moment, the same chapter, the same verse. The wisdom of God is vast, right? It's not limited. So number one role is you depend on the Holy Spirit when you're studying and teaching God's word, right? So let's look at the remaining points. Um, we, we stopped at this, teach with the wisdom of the spirit. Then we look at allowed to receive material gifts. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 6. Galatians 6. Verse 6. Yes, anyone can read that? Galatians 6, verse 6. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Right. So basically, Paul is saying those who are teachers, anyone who receives instruction. So he's talking about those who are receiving on the receiving end receive instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor so i know it's it's written here only uh, allowed to receive material gifts now the context that paul is talking about is both material and um, just being able to pour into their lives as well right now remember as teachers as leaders uh, there are times when, you know, we're in a place where sometimes, you know, we don't know who to talk to, who to share with. But here it says, receive anyone who receives instruction, the word, must share in all good things. There'll be not only material blessings. You know, the greatest joy for a teacher, right, is to see their student 
doing good right it doesn't need to be only ministry right now imagine this imagine a teacher you go back to your you know you've been a naughty kid in school right and you go back after 15 years you say ma'am so you taught me this subject i didn't understand anything in your subject but now i am a doctor or i am an engineer there is a greater joy you know the teacher is not going to remember all the trouble that has happened right but the teacher is going to remember that right uh and i got this wonderful opportunity to meet with uh a teacher of mine he was my english teacher and i met him recently maybe 6 7 months back um and english was my was a good subject for me but i was very disinterested in the other subjects right uh, talking about maths and kannada and all of that right uh, it was not something that i was interested in but when we met uh, you know he asked me what do you do i said you know i'm in the church i work in the church he, he was so surprised he said you're working in the church you're a, you're a pastor you know? you know because he knows you know what kind of a boy i was but that is the greatest joy and when we as teachers you know we look at those who have gone on from our college itself and started their own ministries started doing i i, I know of a couple of guys who were i think in the 2000 and 17 or 16 batch 16 17 and uh, they are in uh, i forget which city they are in but uh, they started powerful ministries right and they sent me a couple of videos you know they are driving out demons and you know and so many people have come and what a joy it is right these young boys going back and that is the greatest joy than any other thing right so yes material things are important but the greatest joy of a teacher is to see the student excel in what they're doing right and so paul is writing here now remember the church in galatian was a confused church right? uh, they were going through confusion there were gentiles mostly gentiles and there were jews the jews became believers but the jews were forcing the other jews or the gentiles okay you believe in jesus but you also need to get circumcised right so there was a confusion now remember that paul just went there he stayed there for probably few months and he moved on to his next journey right he came back to jerusalem so he didn't stay there for a long time but these leaders he's talking about teachers in the church he's trying to encourage them as well right he's talking to even the believers in the church right <clears throat> ensure sound doctrine let's read those let's read all those verses because sound doctrine is especially when you look at ministry it is the most important aspect in teaching because we can come up with our own doctrines yes is it easy to come up with doctrines when you read, look at church history and i think you're studying that this semester church history has people coming up with all kinds of doctrines you got the jehovah's witness you got the i don't want to name more any more of them but there are so many right what are these these are all people who came up with their own thinking own ideologies paul is saying ensure you teach sound doctrine right uh, let's read those verses first timothy chapter 1 verse 3 somebody else can anyone else can open 1 Timothy 6:3 and then 2 Timothy 4:3 and Titus 1:11 so let's read all those verses 1 Timothy 1:3 Timothy 1 verse 3 yeah. as i urged you when i went to macedonia remain in ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine mm. now well, okay go ahead let's read the next verse <clears throat> 1 Timothy 6:3 If anyone teaches wise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching go ahead just read and complete the verse they are conceited and understanding nothing yeah yeah he uh, yeah it goes on he is conceited they and understands understand nothing, nothing. Mm. they have an unhealthy interest mm. in controversies and quarrels about words that results in envy strife malicious talk evil 
suspicions. Suspicious. Right? So we see here now both these letters, both these verses that we read just now. Paul is writing his last two epistles to Timothy. Now, why did he choose Timothy? Uh, I believe that Timothy was in a place in Ephesus, which was he was a young pastor, first of all, right? And he's taking up a church in Ephesus, which is a hostile environment. And Paul is writing his last epistles. He's making sure to give Timothy certain instructions, right? So this letter is not to the church. It is to Timothy, right? And what is he saying there? In the first verse that we read, uh, 1 Timothy 1.3, first verse that we read, mm. I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines. Right now, here's the thing in Ephesus. Uh, I'm sure we've studied the background of Ephesus, right? It's a harbor, there's a lot of business trade, and there was uh, uh, people were kind of wealthy because of the business and trade that was happening, but there was a lot of immorality as well, right? Now, these people are becoming believers. Now, their heart has changed, the spirit has changed. Right? Okay, they know, okay, I believe in Jesus, but the mind has not yet been transformed. So their thinking is still, how can I get more money? How can I get people to listen to me? How can I become more famous? Or how can, uh, uh, how can you know, I get attention? How can I gain money? So these are the natural things, but the spirit is changed. They become believers, right? But the mind is still in that way. So Paul is talking to, he's telling Timothy, I urged you, you stay back in, Ephesus, you stay there because what's happening in Ephesus, people are spreading wrong doctrines. Right now, he's telling them in the church, he's not talking about people outside in the church. Now, I'm just going to give a few examples, right? It, it may, not, may not be this was the false doctrines, but what are the false doctrines that can come up? It could be, you know, what uh, instead of uh, the Lord's table, what you can do is you can also involved in you know you can do this or uh, you can eat of the food offered to idols nothing wrong because you're already partaking of this or uh, the doctrines can be you know jesus has already come and gone his second coming has he's already come or jesus can will heal only if you do this uh, a doctrine of works or you know the holy spirit will come upon you only if you believe the gifts of the spirit is only for now it need not be completely oh uh, you know opposite to the scriptures right and i always say a lie is a lie right uh clean glass of water one drop of drainage water the entire water is contaminated right so a false doctrine does not need to be something which is you know very wrong it can be something very simple but it's false false is false true is true Right now, when we say the gifts of the Holy Spirit is only for those who pray 10 hours a day, is it true? It's not true. So, is it false? Yes. But is it like something that is, uh, uh, you know, something going against God, like very big? Now, it may not be like a very big thing, but it's false. Right now, these false doctrines are happening in the church in Ephesus. Uh, and if you go on in the, if you look at church history, many, many, many false doctrines came up, arose, right? And even now, there are many wrong teachings. So Paul is saying, you ensure that what you teach is sound doctrine, right? What does the other verse say? Six and three, if anyone fails to teach false doctrines and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, what happens if that person uh, does not listen to sound teaching and agrees to false doctrines? Here's what will happen. Verse four, he becomes conceited. He understands nothing. He has an unhealthy interest in controversies. There are quarrels which result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicion, constant friction, corruption, and that's such a big list. Why? Because of false doctrines. So Paul is saying, you as teachers, 
as ministers of God. Ensure you teach what is right. Second Timothy chapter four and verse three. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter four verse three. Yeah. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. For a time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Now look at the difference here. In the first two verses, he says Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, you make sure what you're teaching is sound doctrine. And if there is doctrines that have come in, you teach the word. Make sure what you're teaching is right. Now, in the second epistle, he's saying, why am I saying all this? Because a time will come in the future. And I think he's also referring to the time at that time, even now. Time will come when people will not be happy or satisfied with sound doctrine. They will want to hear what their itching ears want to hear. Right? Now, if you look at it, now is prosperity good? But prosperity is good. God wants to prosper us. He himself says, Jeremiah 29, 11, what does he say? I have plans to prosper you, to give you a good hope. I have plans to prosper you. God wants to prosper us. Now, what is wrong? with prosperity. Nothing is wrong. What is wrong with blessing? Nothing is wrong. Grace, mercy, all of that are attributes of God that he wants to give us. Now, whenever we push it over the line, what happens? It becomes? Yeah. When you push certain things over a certain limit, where, where God has placed a limit, he says, okay, this is, this is how you do it. This is how you preach. This is how you teach. He always has certain guidelines. Now, in the moment you come and say, as a you know, when we look around at, at the gospel, many people have asked us, right? What is wrong with this? Why, why, uh, why are you saying don't listen? I mean, uh, I mean, this prosperity gospel. What is wrong with it? Nothing wrong with it. God wants to prosper us, but the way things are done is not right. Right? The 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 nature of God, the attribute. We want to be prosperous. Nobody is going to say, I don't want to be prosperous. God himself is not saying, I don't, uh, you know, he's saying, I'll prosper you. But when we push it and we say, you know, unless you do this, you will not be prosperous. Now, how can we say that? Right? How can, if you see in the book of Deuteronomy, he says, how can you curse when I have blessed? Right? You can't do that. So when we look at what's happening around us, greed for money. What does Paul say? Money is the root of all evil. Is money evil? If money is evil, then nothing we can do in ministry, nothing we can do in this world. Right? We need money, but the love for money is the root of all evil. Now what happens? When a pastor or a ministry starts small, they're not bothered about money. Oh, I want to do well. I want to, I want to see the church grow. Now the church is growing. It becomes big, 500,000, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000. What happens? I'm not saying all of them, but what happens? They get a taste of things, right? And they want more. So that is where, as Paul is saying, ensure that we Paul, you know, you guard yourself. It's very important for us to ensure sound doctrine. Right? Uh, he, let's read Titus one eleven as well. Titus one eleven. They must be silent because they are turning to unreasonable conversation by their false teaching. Mm, if you yes. Let's also read the context from verse 10. It says, For there are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. Interesting, right? We've never heard this where Paul is saying, Oh, there's a group called circumcision group. He's basically talking about the Jews, right? And then he goes on to say, For there are many rebellious people, mere talkers. They must be silenced because they are running 
they're running whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach and that for the sake of dishonest gain now picture this you got jews becoming believers and there are some teachers who have come in between and they're saying if you give offerings if you get circumcised if you give your offerings to god like what we used to do god will bless us double now you are blessed god will bless you double now tell me which jew won't go ahead and do that they will do it because they they don't know right now are they to bl be blamed yes and no yes because they they should say no the word of god i mean uh, the, the jesus is there J jesus is enough he's done the thing he's paid the price and no because they were still young they were babies in christ and these guys have other teachers have come in between and you know you know what you have to get circumcised you do one thing you get circumcised right because you're obeying the law also and then you believe in jesus or another false doctrine could be you get circumcised only then you can get water baptized so water baptism is important you get circumcised you get water baptized i'm just giving you these examples these are the things that may have come up all are saying there's a circumcision group who are bringing up all kinds of deceitful talks and they're doing all of this for their own gain they must be silenced paul was stern right he said they must be silenced right now titus it was again somebody who the apostle paul groomed and mentored over many years so he's writing to the believers in crete he's saying silence them that's what he did even to Timothy. He said, silence them. So, especially now, you know, now we have media and we can watch so many sermons all across the globe. Yes, so many teachings, right? I remember this. I was, I was just recently reading a, an article, okay? The article was uh, the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Uh, Mormons, right? The Mormon Church. Have you heard of the Mormon Church? Uh, you'll uh, you'll uh, learn in Christian history, right? Uh, Mormon Church. So they have very very nice articles, right? And the Mormon Church is considered one of the richest churches. They're very uh, a big church, and they've got only these you know uh, high you know people who are highly in the uh, business and top guys there. Right? Uh, uh, you'll find it also in in Bangalore and our nation. They're slowly growing as well. Reading this article, beautifully read, beautifully written, right? Uh, article. But right down in the bottom, it said, The Church of the Latter day Saints, Mormon. Now, everything was nice, right? Everything was scripture, right? But at the end, it was written. So, what, you know, it talks about the Mormon, what, the, what, uh, what happened in the Mormon church. And, but the first portion was the gospel, like the proper, uh, the word of God. So if you look at what's happening around us, it's very easy to fall into unsound doctrines, false doctrines. Now, how do you and I keep a check? How can we keep a check? I'm listening to this. How do I know this is? Now, this pastor may be a pastor of a church with 20,000 people. Good. But how do I know what he's preaching is sound? Right? Just because he's saying it doesn't mean that I have to believe it. Right? No, especially now if he says, you know, Jesus uh, did this in his ministry, he, he did many miracles, that's true. But if he says something where you feel in your spirit, hey, uh, I need to double check this, double check it. Right? There'll be, I was listening to a, a sermon where you know, this, this pastor was preaching and it's a wonderful, right? He's a mega church pastor. And in that church, he's preaching and he's saying, I wish God, see, God made Adam and Eve, male and female. Yes, so, so it's sort of nice. So I was just listening to it, male and female. And he said, if I was there, I would have told God, make somebody in the middle as well. 
like what we have right now, right? We have transgenders, right? So male, female, I would have told God you make. And as a child of God, maybe God would have heard me. Now, the moment I heard that, I put a big question mark. Now, I'm not saying all his teachings are wrong. All the doctrines that he's teaching is wrong. But this is wrong. And the moment I heard it, I said, this is not right. But do I listen to his other sermons? I listen, but I'm very cautious. Every word that I listen to, I make sure that I'm listening to it and, I, and it's right. There's another sermon, a wonderful preacher. I'm not going to name him. Wonderful preacher. He's a teacher and a preacher. Wonderful. Very powerful. And he was, he's was he got a big church, maybe 30,000 odd people. Wonderful writer and teacher of God's word. Powerful preacher. But he writes, he, there's a sermon where he says that David and Jonathan, right? They were friends, right? The psalmist said, in the Psalms, he says, he's my, he's like my own, like he's like my own uh, soul. David and Jonathan, in his sermon, he says, four out of five times, only Jonathan knew where David is. So it is most likely that Jonathan went and told his father, King Saul, where David is. That's why David, sorry, that's why King Saul could find David. So if you track from the time David was running away, it is true. Because maybe I'm just giving an example. I think it was three times. But every time David was hiding, only Jonathan knew where he was hiding. But a couple of chapters later, King Saul finds him. Right? So they say, so in the sermon he says, maybe he went and told his father, David is hiding there. Now, we know from scriptures, King Saul was the king. How difficult is it for him to find a person? He had an entire army in his hands. He would have found him easily. So then, now, the first thing I'll go back and see scriptures. When I heard that, I went back to the scripture and says, is it, is it true? But the scriptures doesn't say that. Right? Jonathan was there with David all the while. He, they were friends. They were one in spirit. So I knew, OK. But do, I, do we you know, reject the whole person? No. So false doctrines, wrong teachings will pop up. You get into God's word. If you're unsure, take time. Who's the best teacher? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you, you tell me, what should I do? If this is something that I should wait on, if I should try to understand, help me to understand. Right? Take your time. So ensure sound doctrine. Now comes another important point. Women teachers. Right? Let's read 1 Timothy 2.12. And I'm sure we've heard a lot about this. First Timothy 2, verse 12. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Now, this is very important to take text and put it into context. That is very, very, very important. What will I normally do? I will, if I read this and I say, I do not permit a woman to teach and have authority over a man, she must be silent. I will never give a woman to teach in the church or teach or even lead prayer. Now, what is the context? Paul is writing to Timothy, who is in Ephesus. Ephesus is known for women who were prostitutes. They were temple prostitutes. And these women are coming into the church. They were coming into the church, and they were wanting prominence in the church, right? So Paul is saying, for now, I don't let these women to teach because they need to grow. They need to develop themselves. They need to come out of certain things, right? So the context is the women want preference. They want to be in front. They want to, because by nature, that's how they were, right? Uh, as temple prostitutes, they were outgoing. There were people who would 
talk and they were not shy of what they were doing. It was a religious thing to be a temple prostitute. It was an honor for them. And now they've become believers, not all of them, but they, they become believers and they're coming into the church and they wanted prominence. So Paul is saying, I don't allow a woman to teach now. Did Paul have uh, women as leaders? Plenty. Who is the pastors of the church in Rome? The Roman church. Aquila and Priscilla. Who was the first believer when he went into Philippi? Lydia, purple merchant. right? So if you see, there are a lot of women that Paul has chosen. He didn't say, I don't allow a woman to teach into the Roman church. He didn't say, I don't allow a woman to uh, preach and teach to the church in Galatia. Right? So there's a context. The context is the place. He's looking at the place, the background, and saying, not yet. I don't allow you to preach now. I don't allow you to teach now. So now, if you look at now, what does Paul say in certain scriptures and to the Corinthians? He says, everyone are equal. We are neither Jew nor Gentile nor Greek. We are not male, female. Everyone are the same. You can have a man, right, a, a, a male who knows the Lord, for 10 years and not do anything about it. And just be satisfied. But you can have a woman who knows the Lord and for maybe for one year and be completely sold out for Christ. There's a big difference. Right? So if you look at now, God does not look at man and woman. It is the same Holy Spirit that God has given us. Right now, if we say uh, no, but uh, the office or the the fivefold ministry is only for men, is that favoritism? Yes or no? Yes, right. Now, is God a god of favoritism? No. Very simple, right? Now, if you, if you you should read this book, women especially, I encourage you read the book Chasing the Dragon. Chasing the Dragon by Jackie Pullinger. What a powerful book. What women of God, these men, these, and we've seen uh, Amy Carmichael, right? Uh, Catherine Coleman, women of God. And they did great work. So it is the context. If women teaching was a false doctrine, God would not have enabled them to be so fruitful in their ministries. Right? They were fruitful, they did great works. So the context, always take the context. Now I know in villages and in towns uh, and even here in cities, sometimes you know people have emailed us and said, how come you're letting a woman preach? In city, right? we get those emails. And it's, it's not wrong for people to ask, but we give them the word of God. What does God's word say? Give them verses. And we are, they, we are always open as a pastoral team. We are always open to suggestions, to, uh, you know, to questions. And we try to answer them. Right? And we tell them, you can feel free to come and talk to us. And uh, you know, they can ask questions. So are women teachers OK? Is it God's will? Yes. Is God going to use women teachers as a? Yes. Right? So nothing should stop them. Right. Then. Develop the ability to teach well. Second, First Timothy three two. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach. Yeah. The my the uh, NIV says the with the ability to teach. Now the ability to teach is developed over time. Yes, right. Not only to teach. If you look at anything, right, it's developed over time. If you look at a five-year-old child, and he's learning to ride cycle, when he's ten, what will he start doing? He start leaving both his hands and riding. Right? Why? Because he's developed that ability. It's simple. It's, he's done it for five years. The same way, you and I must develop the ability to teach God's word. Now, how do I do that? Go back, right? Look at examples, right? I remember this one time I was, I think it was my early twenties. 
just became a believer. I didn't know much about God's word, but I happened to uh, stumble upon this passage where in the book of Acts, uh, I had no clue about Paul's uh, missionary journey and all of that because it was too much for me to understand. But in the book of Acts, uh, uh, Acts 27, I stumbled upon this, right? Where it says that, uh, uh, he, he, sorry, Acts 28, Acts 28, uh, he's in the island of Malta, right? And uh, verse 5 says, Paul shook the snake off into the fire and offered no ill effects. I was so happy to see that. But I just I just happened to read that uh, Acts 28. And I thought, oh man, nice sermon uh, sermon uh, we can make, no? Shake off the viper. <laughs> so I remember my early one of the first sermons that I ever prepared was shake off the viper, right? And I made those points. Right? Okay, now I didn't know much, so then I had to go back, find out what is what is this viper? What 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 happened in the context of this, right? So. You and I develop the ability to teach. We learn. If we go back to, uh, if you're teaching Old Testament survey, or if you're teaching uh, things like you know, uh, the offerings, you have to go back and be able to understand, right? Now, uh, if you, you know, one of the things that I like to do is to, you know, always pictureize when you're talking about old testament and the offerings and the sacrifice pictureize it so you got the outer courts you you show them the picture say this is the outer courts inner courts most holy place this is what was there done here and this is what was done here and so we develop this ability to teach right over time and um, it involves a lot of preparation right so paul is talking to the leaders here to the bishops the overseers in the church in Ephesus saying, don't just be, you know, trying to do, uh, have that place of leadership, must develop the ability to teach God's word. Priority. People may, will also see our life as an example, but remember that people will listen to what we see, say also. Recently, I just got a message from a, one of our church folks and he said, you said this in the sermon on Monday. Monday morning, first message that I see. You said this in the sermon. Uh, I wanted to understand a little more. I was talking to myself. It was just a small point. They listen. Right? So we must have the ability, develop the ability to teach. And here in Bible college, uh, for the online students, you can you know, probably do it in your rooms. You can you know, prepare sermons. So what you can do is use your morning times, right? The morning time. Yes, you want to preach, but also use it to teach. Three-point sermon, right? Three bullet points. Okay, I'm teaching about faith. One, two, three, three points. Right? Just make it like a teaching as well. Right? It doesn't need to be only preaching, right? Oh, Jesus said to the mountain, move. Uh, Jesus walked on the storm. Sometimes what happens, we'll give 10 examples on faith. We don't need to do that. Three points, just three points. This one, two, three, and use it in your morning times, right? Uh, and then you learn the develop. You'll develop the ability to teach the word of God, and then you prepare sermons. You know, if you look at the, all of these, I think I've shared with you, right? All of these sermons in my Bible, right? These papers here, online students, all of these, all of these, are Bible college when I was in Bible college. They're more than 15 years old. These are sermons that I prepared for the, okay, not, maybe few of them are not, but most of it, these big ones are all prepared. If you read it, when I read it, I say, what am I teaching here? I don't know. This is, but they help me. And I used to prepare, sit in front of the mirror and teach the whole thing. Teach the whole thing, all of these. Right? So develop it. It will not come. We may have the gift of the prophecy. We may have the gift of the teacher or the evangelistic gift, but we need to develop it. Yes or no, right? We have the gift of singing. If, I, if we don't sing, what will happen? It will be dormant. God is not a God who will take away the gift. It's there, but we have not used it. right? So we have to develop it. 
if if you're interested in music and uh, you know okay i've got a year for music i can do well in music if i don't go for classes or if i don't learn what'll happen nothing will happen the gift will be there you will also be there but nothing's going to happen right there needs to be the effort of developing that gift same way in teaching preaching right develop the gift and then second timothy 2:2 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Powerful. Look at Paul. His mindset is always raise up other people. He never had a mindset of I alone. Could he have done it alone? Yes. But he also followed the model of Jesus. Jesus always worked, raised up leaders. And I read this book. Uh, I forget the name of the book, but the art, the the I think it was a book by uh, brother Andrew Womack. And he says, the moment you start a ministry, that moment you should plan your exit. Right? You start a ministry, that moment you start planning your exit also. If I have to leave, if I have to move out, who is going to take it on? Raising up leaders, raising up teachers is the greatest sign of a leader. Jesus, the first thing he did, picture this. Jesus launched out to ministry, 40 days of fasting, overcome those temptations, came back and did what? First thing, chose 12 people. Because he knew I have three and a half years. And if I don't raise up other people, who is going to do this ministry? Now, that effort of three and a half years, we went through many ups and downs trying to handle these people. But he did it. He raised up people. right? And you and I must raise up others. What does Timothy say? He says, commit to those who will faithfully do and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach each other. Right? He says, commit to other people who will also be qualified to teach each other. So as leaders, develop others, raise up others, give them opportunities. Right? Uh, I, I always wonder, right? what if as young people, we don't give opportunities to our youngsters? They will, they will not grow. It'll just be like, okay, you do what you're doing. No. And we want we want our young people to learn. We want, and especially now in the generation that we are in, young people are way ahead in their thinking. Right? My eight-year-old comes and says, Tell me what are the gifts of the Holy Spirit and how can I begin to flow in it? I said, Okay, sit down. <laughs> I'll tell you. Right? Eight years old. It says, okay, Father, Son, Dada, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, I'm not able to understand this Trinity. Can you please explain it to me in a good way? Dada, do you know they found Noah's Ark? Okay. Do you know this thing? He's talking about Old Testament. Now, children nowadays know so much more, and it's good. You got advantage, you got disadvantage also. Because they're ex exposed to so much. They learn so much, which we don't want them to learn. But there's also the fact that they can grasp things so much easier than when we were. Right? You play a, what I normally do is I play sermons or songs, right? worship songs. Uh, and it just keeps playing in the background. Right? Sometimes my little ones come and say, they suddenly sing all these new songs. So how do you know the song? Well, we heard it. And they're singing it exactly, word for word. Right? Nobody gave them lyric sheet and said, this is the lyrics. No, everything is, is gone and they're able to grasp so easily. So raising up leaders must be a priority for us. Right? Whether they are kids, even when they grow up, teens, youth, 
raise up leaders, give them opportunities. As ministry leaders, or for example, you're planting a church, you're starting your own ministry, have people who can take on leadership, train them up, develop them for leadership. Never be uh, in a place where, okay, what if they become better than me? Never be in that place. Let them become better than you. That's okay. Right? The point is you, we have to raise up others. And then false teachers. Again, uh, we talked about this as well. Second Peter 2.1. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. Again, Peter's writing. Right, he's saying there will be false teachers, false prophets, who will bring who will bring you know destructive heresies, uh, uh, even denying the fact that Jesus is Lord and what will happen to them they will they are bringing destruction upon themselves look at what's happening now Jesus is not God Jesus is not the Messiah Jesus went to Nepal and sat Jesus was here Jesus was there now I am Jesus I'm the reincarnation of Jesus and Jesus already met me now I'm very weary I'm not saying don't believe it, but I'm very weary when people say I went to heaven and came back and this is what Jesus told me. It's good for them. right? Now, testimony is good, but I'll go by God's word. And I went to hell and came back. right? Have you seen all of those? So it may be true. Maybe they have an out-of-body experience and all of that, but I will trust in God's word. I'll just go by what God says. I remember watching one video, one guy, he had full dreadlocks and tattoos all over his body, nose ring and his uh, lip ring and all kinds of things. I went to hell and came back. I said, you came back also? That's <laughs> <laughs> so just a joke, right? But but he was giving a testimony. In front of me. I said, okay, good. I'm not going by looks, but the way he was talking so casually about it. I thought to myself, hey, will you be casual about these kind of things? We're going to heaven and coming back. Will we be casual about it? Remember Isaiah? He said he saw the throne of God. What, is he, what did he say? Oh, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. What does Paul say? I went up to third heaven. I can't even express the things that I have seen there. I'm not even able to talk about it. But nowadays, people are going on trips and coming back heaven <laughs> and hell. So, so let them go and come. But let's go by God's word. Right. God's word is important. Uh, let's stay on God's word. So there will be heaven, hell, rapture. Uh, all these new ideologies will come. You say, okay, you went to heaven and came. Good. I'll study God's word. Stay on God's word. Right? Okay. So let's close. Uh, next class, we'll pick up from chapter 8, the restoration, the ministry of the teacher. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Have a great day ahead. God bless. God bless.